We're so glad you're here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I was thinking the other day about how important church has always been in Western society, that there's a place you gather every single week that you're in community, that there's this place where we all, you know, gather before God's throne. It's such an important rhythm in life. And I want to encourage you to plug into a church. You know, a church is like a gym. You don't just go once. You need to really be a part of the church. You need to go for like consistently every week for like six months. And then you meet, meet people and you make friends. It's such a good thing to have in your rhythm. So anyway, if you're, a, if you're new here, I want to encourage you to not just be here, but be here every week. Make this a part of a discipline of life. And I think six months from now, you'll be really, really happy you did. Anyway. Well, whoever you are, would you stand with us? We're going to say this creed together as we do every week. Hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Lord. Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. Trust my friend Jesus and share his love with my neighbor. Thanks. The title of my message today is Invest in God. Invest in people. It pays out dividends. There's something in life that Jesus teaches us that is good advice whether you're a person of faith or not. He tells us that those who are humble will be exalted and those who exalt themselves will be humbled. There is a principle in the world that you can study simply by observing the way people and everyone is, that people who humble themselves are exalted, both in this life and in the next. Today, I want to talk about the importance of becoming, as much as you can, an unoffendable person, about, become, about getting freedom from comparing yourself to other people, from getting stuck in these sewing circles where everybody talks about all the great things they're doing, from crippling yourself financially by owning things to impress other people rather than just wanting it for yourself, and the many, many, many traps that come when we are always exalting ourselves before people because of something that's going on much deeper, and how even when we do impress those people, that need that is inside of us, it's not really met. That very often a truly successful life, whether you're talking about things as worldly as business or academia, or you're talking about the spiritual life, real success comes when we humble ourselves, when we come to life with an empty cup, not a full cup, when we come with open hands, not closed fists, when we come to find a need and fill it rather than come to everyone to make them meet our needs or to recognize our, our things. And most importantly, in life, the old saying, what goes around comes around, is true. Uh, it is true. If you are feeling blue and you, you need some encouragement, encourage other people and you'll start to feel it. I literally feel it. When I look at someone, I say, thank you for what you do, and I mean it, or encourage someone because they're doing something great for me. I feel like a tingle up my spine. Do you get that too? You get weirdly lifted up when you lift others up. And as you do that, you begin to store up for yourself a gigantic bank of goodwill in the kingdom of the heavens that will pay out in dividends in your life. This is what Jesus teaches us, by the way. It's an important part of Jesus' ministry is teaching us the economics of heaven. In the world, we have economics. We have dollars and cents and businesses and things. But the kingdom of the heavens has its own economic system, a system in which we can invest, a system from which we can withdraw, a system that many of us have racked up huge debts that we feel like we cannot pay. Anybody feel indebted sometimes spiritually? So Jesus teaches us he says, store for yourselves treasures that are in the heavens where moth and rust can't destroy and thieves can't dis cannot steal. Look, many of us who grew up in church or in Sunday school, when we think about treasure in heaven, 
We don't think about it as treasures in the heavens. And this is a translation mistake in the Bible in English. In other translations, they don't typically do this. But in English, it usually says heaven. But in Greek, it actually says the heavens. That's because in Jesus' day, the word heaven didn't just mean the place you go to when you die, if you, if you trust in Christ, right? It, it, it didn't just mean heaven, the pearly gates. Heaven could also mean outer space, the stars and the planets and all this stuff. And heaven can literally mean the air around you. So in those days in Aramaic, you could say, yeah, a bird flew from that tree through heaven to that tree because heaven was, in the, was like the air around you. So to store treasure in the heavens didn't necessarily mean just heaven when I die. It meant that it's like treasure in the air. Does that make sense? It's really like spiritual treasure. It's like treasure that's somehow around you. What, what kind of treasure can that be? That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. I'll explain it to you here in a moment. But I want to convince you today it's the best kind of treasure you can have in this world. It's the best treasure. Many of us who grew up in Sunday school, you know, we... We saw treasure in heaven. We pictured Scrooge McDuck jumping from a diving board into a pool full of gold coins. Anybody watch DuckTales? Probably not. <laughs> so I think treasures in the heavens, what Jesus is teaching us, is Jewish wisdom that there is this intangible thing in the air that we can draw from in life if earlier we invested our treasure there. If you hear anything, I say, hear this. Soar up treasure in heaven. It's not gold when you die. It's stuff like favor. God's favor in your life. Opening doors no one can shut. Shutting doors no one can open. It's favor with your neighbor. Favor with your city. It's people saying, she is, he is a trustworthy Person. Work with him, don't work with him. Work with her, don't work with her. It is wisdom. Wisdom is a heavenly treasure that's once you have it, no one can steal it from you, no one can take it from you. And by the way, if you share it, it only grows. Or joy, joy from the Holy Spirit is a heavenly treasure that no one can take from you. Goodwill from be doing what is right always, from doing the next right thing. Goodwill in your business with your boss or your employees or your neighbors or your family. That is a heavenly treasure that no one can take from you. And it pays out, my friends, in dividends. You can lose all the money in the world but if you have that stuff, you've got something better. Something much, much better. And by the way, can we just say that in the same way that some people have treasure in heaven, many, many people have racked up, what can we call it, heavenly debts? Heavenly debts that you've got, you have borrowed from goodwill and you are behind on your promises. When people see you, they know you cannot work with him. You cannot trust him. Heavenly debts are folly, making the same foolish mistake over and over and over and treating people poorly and putting people down and not putting first things first like your kids and your family and your values. When you put those things to the side and you, you fall into the worldly way of life, the, heavenly, the, the fruits of heavenly debt are things like boredom are things like having all the money in the world but being completely empty. Like having means but no meaning. It's not a life of fullness and richness like one that has stored up treasure in heaven, but rather it's a life of lack, even when you have everything in the world. It's a life in which people think of you with indifference at best and distrust at worst. We all know people who have racked up debts in the kingdom of the heavens, and we all know people who have treasure in the kingdom of the heavens. And you want to be like the people who have treasure in heaven. It's a kind of treasure you can withdraw from today. I wish people would just do what I say. I have, this is good advice, my friend. If you do this, I promise you, your life will be better. So in life, it is so important that we stop trying to impress the world with worldly treasure but we try to impress the Lord with heavenly treasure. And then we store up for ourselves the kind of thing that does not rust and destroy. 
And this is what Jesus teaches us. It begins with the value of a heart that's like an empty cup, one that's ready to learn, to receive, to hear from others. It's not from a heart that is arrogant, prideful, embittered, and easily offendable. It's from a heart that is humble, that is humble, that says, Lord, forgive me of my sins because I've forgiven everybody else of their sins too. That's a prayer in the, that's the Lord's prayer. Jesus teaches the disciples to be humble because it's the best way to live life. Now this was less common in his day. Rome was all about glory. It was into that world that Jesus said, in this world, everybody exercises authority and everybody is all about glory and, and no, but if you want to live in the kingdom of God, you have to serve. You have to become humble. Those who are the least of these will be the greatest in God's kingdom. And that's why Jesus famously dressed up like a slave the lowest position in Rome. Embarrassing, humiliated, dressed up like a slave and wash the feet of his students. Wouldn't that be weird if your famous professor dressed up like a slave and started washing all of the students' feet? It was even weirder in Jesus' day. He was a weird guy. He is a weird guy, Jesus. He does stuff we're not used to. He challenges the way we see things. But all that he teaches us is good advice for a good life. It's a story that says that Jesus is sitting at a, at a table of a prominent Pharisee. So Pharisee is a good thing in those days. It's like a famous pastor. Be like, Jesus is invited, you know, to our version of Billy Graham. And Billy Graham is there, and there's all these famous religious leaders and thinkers and people who own and charities and things, and Jesus, and it's probably to honor Jesus himself, this now famous prophet and rabbi. And as he's sitting there quietly watching these men gather around their, the table, they're all sort of gently but efficiently jockeying for positions of honor at the table. Everybody wants to sit a little closer to Billy Graham, you know, and, and, and the closer they are to him, people go, oh, what does he do? Oh, what's he from? Oh, that. We all know this, don't we? And Jesus looks at them and he says... In this scripture, Luke 14, when you notice how the guests pick the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, don't take the position of honor. For a person more distinguished than you might be invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, You'll have to take the least important place. Has this ever happened to you before, something like this? Maybe not. It's happened to me like at least six times in my life, something like this. And it's a terrible experience. But when you're invited, take the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all of those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. We all do this, don't we? When we're in a group of our peers, there's this weird way that some of us, we experience, maybe you're in the academic world and all the professors are around and they're talking about the papers they all published or maybe you're with other you know, moms or parents and they're talking about all the amazing things their kids are doing, or the new house they got, or maybe you're with your colleagues, other business owners, or other attorneys, or other doctors, or whatever it is, and they're talking about the accolades, and you feel yourself drawn into it, wanting to say what you've done, and brag about the things that you have, and it's, it, it feels gross, doesn't it? There's a weird, gross something to it all that is not good, that we don't even want in our life. See, when we're humble, we just let go of that stuff. Can we decide today, let's just let go of all of that. Let's let go of ego, of trying to prove things to my peers. You don't have to prove anything to your peers or your parents or your, just let it go, be free. Oh man, wouldn't it be free if instead of always being proud and easily offendable and living with this sort of 
brittle state of mind where you can be easily tilted, we were much stronger and just relaxed in life. If you invest in people, it's going to come around to you. If you lift people up, you will immediately feel lifted up and be putting out into the world around you goodwill. If you are feeling blue and unmotivated, try to motivate someone and you'll feel like kind of revved up and motivated and ready to go. If you're feeling guilty about life, guilty about something, start forgiving other people who have hurt you and you're going to start to feel mercy from heaven and from God. Encouragement is a real spiritual gift that we're instructed to practice. We can do this together. Friend, let me tell you, you do that, you put your arm around someone and you convince them that it's not over yet. You convince yourself it's not over yet. You convince them they're forgiven. You convince yourself you're forgiven. You convince them that God loves them, that the best days are ahead for them. You convince yourself. Even now, as I'm saying this, I'm feeling encouraged. It's like a principle in life. You encourage people, it makes all the difference in the world. Why wouldn't you give away such a tremendous gift when it cost you nothing? What a gift it would be. And what a gift it is to your neighbor when you encourage them. What a gift it is to your friends to tell them, I'm so glad to see you. I missed you. To tell your wife or your husband, I'm so glad I'm married to you. I'm so grateful I get to do life with you. To tell your grandkids, I'm so proud of you. I'm so happy to have you in my life. Even when you say those things again, you feel your own life lift up. And that's not why we do it, but it's, there's just so many benefits. If there's so few things in this world that have such a great personal benefit at such little cost. Why wouldn't we do it? When you lift other people up, you lift yourself up. When you lift other people up, you'll be lifted up. And don't forget to bless the Lord. Today, bless the Lord before you go to bed and bless him when you rise. Would you do that? Would you just try it and see how much better your life becomes when you use your words to impact the lives of your neighbor and to bless people? It'll come around. It'll make all the difference in the world. Lord, we bless your name and we thank you for life. Thank you that we get to be here in your presence. We are so grateful. Forgive us of the times when we've been so offendable and arrogant. And, and we just ask God you forgive us in Jesus' name and help us to be more like Christ. It's the best way to live life. Lord, I pray for my friends here and I'm just thankful for them. I pray that you bless their families and bless all their work. I pray that you'd open doors this week for them as they're facing trials and challenges in, in their family life, health problems. Lord, let this be a week of victory. I just proclaim that over you. This will be a week of victory in your life. Make sure you give God the praise when it happens. It's his work. Lord, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Vrienden, welkom bij het YouTube kanaal van Hour of Power. Hier vind je de interviews die ik mag hebben, inspirerende toespraken van Bobby Schuller en de muziek uit onze uitzendingen. En ik hoop dat de gesprekken die ik mag voeren met bekende en onbekende Nederlanders je ook zullen bemoedigen. Nou, ik nodig je uit om de abonneerknop in te drukken op het YouTube kanaal en zo met ons in contact te blijven. Tot ziens bij Hour of Power via YouTube.